as the title says, um, learning to become a monkey. And this is really key to, to how I got started in primatology. That was the, the, the great advice from Professor Itani that he's given to all of his students over the years um, before we fill our heads with, with theories and knowledge and what, what other people have found we should go in and pick a, a study species and learn that species as much as, as we can firsthand. And in that way, to become that monkey so that you can understand what it will do next. And, and you just kind of feel, have, have a feel for, for how it lives, how it exists in its environment. So that's how I really got, got started. I was lucky to be in Japan when that happened. Um, first, just for some some start off information here, as, as all of you know, as, as anthropologists and primatologists, um, humans have a long history. We're all part of, of the um, group called primates. And the human line left, left Africa about 170,000 to 100,000 years ago, and we began to populate the entire globe. And that's kind of a, a uh, something unique about humans and that we can travel so far and adapt in so many places. And as, as, as time went by, we, we became intellectually more um, curious and began to use that intellect to uh, adapt in, in other ways. And a very curious um, thing happened. I can get my next slide up here. Um, a, a, a new variety of species came out, which I like to call Homo sapiens mobilensis. This, this urge to move and pioneer new, new places continued. And within that, a, another subset of, of, of humans, the, the primatologist, came about. And this curiosity is perhaps triggered by this um, unique Y chromosome, always questioning about his environment, about his own existence. And that's kind of really what drives us as primatologists today to understand more about where we came from, how we evolved, and how the other primates are evolving and adapting in their own environment. In that tradition, I'd like to introduce a little bit about my own family. We have that, that traveler's gene, as, as many people did in the late 1800s. Um, a, a, a number of, of people from Europe went to um, North America. And my great-great-grandmother, Edith Neal, um, 10 years after she was born in um, Bali Bray in Ireland, she left with her mother and her siblings, left, left the menfolk at home, and they moved to North America. They traveled by ship. It was about a, about a six-week trip over on, on a, a sailboat and um, arrived in New York, worked a little bit, saved some money. And then, as everyone else in those days, they decided to travel further west. Um, my great grandmother found a partner and they began to raise a family. That's my grandmother in the middle, the, the, the younger daughter in the middle. And they went across country in a covered wagon like, like most people did. First, they settled in Nebraska, but then they decided to go a little bit further to Colorado, which is where I, I was born. And being farmers back in Ireland, they um, commenced to growing potatoes again in, in Colorado, and they started their life in a little house on the prairie. Um, I was born many years later, um, 1958, in this beautiful city called Denver, Colorado, at the, at the foot of the Rocky Mountains. And interestingly, it's about 100, 150 miles south of where the first primate fossil was found in um, Wyoming. So something was, was telling me I had to move closer to where the primates were. So that's, that's where I was born. Um, and my Y chromosome began to, to activate quite early as a young boy. I was curious about everything. And my mom would read me lots of storybooks. But one that really stuck in my mind and was really is, is the beginning of, of my career as a primatologist, I think, was hearing about the stories of Curious George and this little chimpanzee that got into all kinds of trouble, just like I was doing it at, at the age of four. Um, and while she was reading these stories, I, I'd forgotten that I'd mentioned this, but many years later as an adult, 
my mom reminded me that hearing those stories, I said, one day when I grow up, I want to go to Africa and live with chimpanzees. So throughout my grade school, junior high school, high school days, I was known as Monkey Mike. I was always, always thinking about monkeys, always reading about them in the books and things. But I didn't have to go, oops. I, okay, I'll, I didn't have to go as far as Africa to meet my first chimpanzee. I was um, fortunate to work at the Denver Zoo for three years as a volunteer. And that's where I met my first chimpanzee, a young, young, um, young male called Doobie. And I was able to take care of him in the um, behind the scenes at the Denver Zoo. So that's where I really got firsthand experience about primates and, and, and what they look like, what they smell like, what they sound like. Um, but I also had a lot of, of hobbies. Um, I was very keen in, into climbing mountains, being born and raised in Colorado. That's what everyone tends to do. Um, but I was also interested, I had, I had a, a, an interest in art. So I, I did some painting and I took up um, leather carving. I would make shirts from buckskin and moccasins, things like that. So I was always doing something to make a little extra money. So I was saving, saving money to, to buy an airplane ticket to go somewhere. I, I had this growing interest to see monkeys and there was no monkeys in Colorado. So um, with, with that in mind, I, I, I began to, to plan on my great escape, how to get out of, out of Colorado and see monkeys. But part of, as, as I was growing up, one of the things that my parents instilled in me was a respect for people of other cultures and different places. And growing up in Colorado, there's a very rich indigenous um, population, a very long history of um, culture in, in different in indigenous tribes in Colorado. So I, I was very keen on, on their cultures as well. I, I read a lot. Um, I made my own pair of moccasins and kind of took, took up their, their um, motto to, to before judging others, put yourself in their position. And, and the saying went, um, before judging your neighbor, walk a mile in their moccasins. Look at things from their perspective. And that's kind of what I've taken in as I looked at primates as well. Um, e even before Professor Itani um, uttered those famous words to me, Mike, go become a monkey, um, I was be beginning to, to become an, an Indian from in North America and, and interested in a lot of different cultures. So I was, I was open to new experiences and going to new places. So the first thing I did, I, I got my passport. This is my first passport. And at the age of 18, with the money that I had saved up, I secretly, without telling my mom and dad, arranged to spend two weeks down in the Caribbean to study vervet monkeys. This was a, a project that was being run by professors from the University of California um, in Los Angeles. And I got accepted to the program. And then I told my mom and dad, hey, guess what? I'm going to the Caribbean. And <laughs> so a few weeks later, after graduating from high school, um, on a, a high school student's budget, I got the cheapest ticket. And you stop in every place an airplane will stop on the way and made it down to Miami the first day. Um, not enough money to, to rent a hotel room, so I actually had my, my, my suitcase and, and a duffel bag wrapped around my arms, and I slept on the bench in front of the check-in counter in, in the Miami airport. I don't know how safe that really was, but I, I survived. And the next morning, um, got on a plane to San Juan, and I noticed the planes got smaller and smaller and smaller as the further I, away I went from, from Denver. Well, it wasn't actually this small, but um, we got into a, a small charter plane and landed in St. Kitts and my monkey adventure began. I was really excited to, to have my first experience with wild monkeys. These monkeys were brought to St. Kitts about 300 years ago during the slave trade. And even at the time that I was there, they were saying that there are more monkeys on the island than people. So for me, it was the perfect, perfect place to get to get started. So I had a really good time um, with with a group of seven college students who were on the same program. We 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 shared a, a a bungalow on the beach in the Caribbean. So I had my first experience with monkeys and my first experience snorkeling in the Caribbean. So it was quite an adventure. But already by that time. I had 
been invited to go to Japan for a six month study abroad program. And it would allow me to get some language credits for my um, undergraduate degree, which were required. And I could do that all in six, in, in six months. So packed up. This time I had a little help from my mom and dad for those, those first six months to, to go, go to school in, in Japan. Um, and packed my bags and said, bye, I'll be back maybe six months or so. It might, might be a little bit longer, but we'll see. So I got on my second big airplane ride. This time, only, only one stop in LA and landed in, in Tokyo. So it was a, a, a much quicker deal, longer distance, but that was actually quite, quite easy to do. It was all quite exciting. So the six months finished, and I had fallen in love with Japan. I had met my future wife, and I decided I should stay here a little bit longer. I was interested in, in, in the language. So I, I, I took 15 months of, of language studies, and we had um, courses in, in the anthropology of, of Japan. And during that time, I began to learn to read and write as well. And I figured, why not learn about Japanese monkeys and Japanese primatology. So one of the professors at the language university gave me a book called The Ecology of the Japanese Monkeys. It's written in Japanese by um, Masao Kawaii, the professor who, who wrote the first paper in English about culture in Japanese monkeys with the potato washing behavior. So I read his book and I commented how, how exciting this was, how interesting it was. And having challenged myself to read a whole book from cover to cover, learn all the, the, the technical terms and things, I just kind of offhand said, wow, I'd really like to meet the author of this book, this um, kawaii person, this kawaii sensei. So a week later, I got, a, I, I, got a, I got word from the professor who gave me the book that Professor Kawaii would actually like to meet me if I could come to Inuyama. Going from Osaka to Inuyama was kind of a big deal for me. I hadn't traveled that much in, in, in Japan yet. So I had to think a little bit, but I was soon convinced that that, was, that, that, that would be a good opportunity. So I, I came here to PRI and I spent about an hour, two hours talking with um, Professor Kawaii. He signed the book and I was about to leave. And he said, hold on just a second. I'm gonna call a friend of mine in Kyoto. I want you to meet him since you're living in that area. So that's when he called Professor Itani and Professor Itani also said, yeah, I'll, I'd, I'd like to meet him, um, have him come to my office on this day at this time. So a week later, I was in Kyoto, and this is Professor Itani on the, um, the up, upper left-hand corner of the screen. And this is the lab and some of the people that were there as graduate students. Um, we talked for an hour or so, and then he started talking about his work in Tanzania and his pioneering work with chimpanzees at Mahale. And the, the discussion went on and on for like two, two and a half hours. And within those two hours, I, I, was, I was convinced that, that this is how I'm, I, I'm able to go to Africa and, and live with chimpanzees. I was very impressed with both of these professors and their, their knowledge, their experience, but also their, their warmth and their kindness to help someone who, whose only credentials was a passion for, for primates. Um, so Professor Itani gave me one of his books about his, his studies in, in um, East Africa during the beginning of, of independence when he and Professor Kawai were looking for study sites to study gorillas and chimpanzees. So I read through that and got really excited again about, about the work that they were doing. And he suggested that I go to Arashiyama, which is a, a primate field site just outside of Kyoto that's been going on since 1954. So with his um, name card and little note on the back as introduction in hand, I went to Arashiyama. And again, I was welcomed by a very, very warm, very generous man, the director of, of the, the park. And he put me up in this little, little hut on the top of the mountain. And I, I could stay there. He had a, a full library. There was gas. There was not running. The, the, the running water was running down a stream. So I had to bring that to the, to the, to the, the guest house there. But I was able to, to live 
on, on top of the mountain for four days a week. And then I went down the other three days and I was, was teaching English in order to, to make, make money to make ends meet. I was supporting myself this whole time. So I was able to spend a whole 12 months from summer to fall to winter to spring and to summer again. And that's where I really became a monkey. And it was at that time really that I was totally convinced that this is where my future laid that I should, should study primatology here in Japan. And um, Professor Itani said, well, if you can, can graduate from undergraduate school and you can get a, a scholarship to come back, then I'll take you into my lab. So with, with, with that promise of, of future studies in Japan and a possibility to go to Tanzania to study chimps, I um, knuckled down and learned all about the Japanese monkeys at Arashiyama, had to learn 250 different faces of different monkeys in the troop, and I began to learn about their social behavior. Some of the things that I started looking at was their feeding, um, a little bit about social learning, because I'm interested in how a young infant could become an adult, how they learned, acquired all of these things. Was it like potato washing? Was it not? Um, but I was also interested in mate choice. Um, so during that mating season in the fall is when I, I began to collect data. And that, that, that year's, that season's data actually became part of my master's project when I came back um, later on in 1983, and it extended on to my PhD. So I had five full years, a five year span with one year, three year opening, and then another two consecutive years. So I could look at trends in females choice of males over the long term. Um, so it was really, really helpful that I could start all of this work as an undergraduate um, with that, that extra bonus of, of, of time to get acquainted with, with the monkeys. And something very interesting happens, totally unexpected. Um, this was exactly halfway through the 12 months that I was at, at Arashiyama. I saw this one young female bring up a pile of stones into the center of the feeding area. And she started stacking them up one on top of another, like children do with, with wooden blocks, things like that. I'd, I'd never seen that before then, but I, I pulled out my camera and I took this picture and I wrote down a, a few notes and she, she stopped within maybe five minutes and it was over. And I never saw it again for the rest of that 12 month period, but I had the photos and I had the notes and I, I took those back with me to the States. Um, so that two and a half years went by very quick. I was, I was very sad to have to leave to stop studying, but in order to continue to do the work that I wanted in the future, I had to go back to Colorado and finish undergraduate school. But before I did that, Africa, is between Tokyo and Denver, if you kind of go all the way around the world to get there. So I decided to use some of my savings and go to Nairobi. And I would meet Professor Itani and some of our, my lab mates who were studying in East Africa. I would meet them in Nairobi and spend some time traveling around Kenya to get to know Africa a little bit. And it was actually then that I met Fred Berkovich um, you, you students here at SciCast will know Fred because he's a former um, faculty member here at, at PRI. Um, but I, I met him when he was a graduate student studying baboons in Gilgil, Kenya. Um, and that's where our friendship began. He was also studying mate choice. Very um, coincidentally, we were studying the same thing so we could compare notes with baboons and Japanese monkeys. Um, when we were in the field like that. So it was a great time to learn another species and to finally put my feet in, in Africa. So that's really when my, my, my work in Africa um, began, so to speaking. Um, from Nairobi, getting back to, to Denver, again, a student's budget. I, I took the cheapest flight and I had a lot of stops and I bought new tickets as I got to, to London because it would be cheaper. and. But I, I managed to, to get back to Denver in, um, in about two or three days, I think. 
And two and a half years later, after I said, I'll be gone maybe six months, I said, hey, mom, dad, I'm back. But I'm going to go back to back to Japan after I graduate. So my plans were fixed. I had I had a had a goal. I had a mission to graduate from undergraduate to get my bachelor's in 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 science. Um, so I had to had to move through that as, as quickly as possible. And I was able to get credit from the time that I was in in Japan, that two and a half years. So I was able to, to, to finish my undergraduate in about two and a half years. And by that time, I was fortunate enough to get a Japanese government scholarship to return back to Japan on a, a MEX scholarship. So in 1983, in October, I was back in Kyoto and I was up at Arashiyama. The first thing that I got that, that I did once I arrived in Kyoto and I went up to the mountain, met the director, wanted to see the monkeys, see what they were doing. And it was that point that that one moment, that five minutes observation that happened in December of 1979, it all, it all opened up a whole new um, field of, of research for me. I was inside the um, feeding hut talking to the director and all of a sudden up on the roof, there's this, this very loud noise, a lot of, of, of calamity. First, I thought it was hail coming down. It, it was clear and sunny, so I ran out and looked up at, at, on, on the roof, clear as a bell, nothing falling from the sky, but there were about 20 monkeys on the roof and they all had stones and they were banging on the, on the metal sheets, rolling it back and forth and banging it. And then I remembered that image of Glantz 64, 76, and heard one episode and I thought, oh my God, this is, these guys have all gotten onto it. So I started a survey that continued up until about 2008 and we were able to document with graduate students and postdocs who came, we were able to look at the transformative period from innovation to diffusion to maintenance and transformation. And what was most striking was that the young individuals that acquired it as infants continued to do it until their old age, 29, 30 years old, they were still playing with these stones. So it became a part of their culture, a solitary object play behavior that was, that was continued throughout the rest of their lives. So we began to think a lot about what kind of influences that can have on, on their um, mental capacity, their mental development, perhaps. Um, so that, that turned into a very long term project. But Africa was still very much in the back of my mind, in, in the forefront as, as, as the years went by. And I had the opportunity when I finished my master's because of my head start with the, the, the mate choice study and everything, I actually had my papers and everything pretty much complete to submit my PhD um, at the end of my master's because I already had five years of study, um, five, a five year period of, of research. Um, and after graduation, Professor Itani took me out for lunch. And as we were going back to the university in the cab, he said, Mike, are you ready to go study chimps in Tanzania? So I was, I was very happy. I had just gotten my master's and then had been, when, been given the opportunity to go to Tanzania. So um, four months later, I was on a plane and off to Tanzania to, to begin my first six months studying chimpanzees in Mahale. And again, one of these, these, these rare instances, when I started, I was actually looking at the social behavior of old aged chimpanzees, what their position in society was, what their roles were. So I was usually following older chimpanzees, but as control individuals, I would pick young or prime adult males and females as, as well. Um, and one day, this was November 21st in the, in the morning, um, I, I ran across a scene that was something a little bit, little bit different from what I've been looking at before. Um, I, I saw this, this, this chimp pick a plant from the forest that I'd never seen them eat before. I was always, um, I, I was always recording what they would eat. And because I was working with a traditional healer who was also a national parks ranger, he was teaching me about the plants that people were using as medicine. 
So this plant I had never seen the chimps use before, um, Chao Shuku grabs a branch, pulls it, and starts to consume it. So I ask Mohammedi, what, what's, what's the name of the plant? And he tells me um, the name Mujonso. And we, we continue watching. Um, and then he says this very important medicine for us, the Watongwe. Um, but it's very, very bitter. So she's, I, I don't know why she's eating this plant. It's not something that they normally eat. And I could, could verify that because basically like what I was doing from, from a, a young boy, the age of a young boy, I was always putting things in my mouth, always eating fruits and flowers and leaves and things from my environment. Um, because I was curious about what, 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 what they all were. But it was just that one, two, well, it was just those two days of observation where we could actually see this chimpanzee get better and better at, after about 15 hours on, on, on this afternoon of the second day, she completely transformed. Her strength had come back, her appetite had come back. We had a hard time just following her as she raced over, over two, valleys and, and a mountain to get to a place where she could eat. Um, so very unusual thing. But because it seemed so important, so critical to that individual to do what she did, that started raising questions in my mind. And I started talking more with Mohammedi. And I finished that study on aged chimpanzees. But from the, the next day on the 22nd, I started focusing more looking to try and see if there are other chimpanzees that were sick or that were using this plant again. Um, so that, that kind of changed my focus against not, not what I had actually planned in the beginning, but like stone handling, something that, that was important to the monkeys and, and to, the, to the, the chimpanzee in this case, got me interested in, in trying to understand what it was that the animal was doing. And that began a long, almost 20 years of work in, in Tanzania and um, a little bit in Uganda and also in Bosu in, in, in Guinea. But um, most of my, my work in, in Mahale after 1987 was on self-medication. And I would do comparative studies in, at, at Gombe and also went to um, Vernon Reynolds' old study site, I, he, he may still be working there. He, he was working there until recently in the Budongo Forest for comparative work. And I had, I, I sent a student, Paula Pebsworth, to work there as well. Um, and then I started a new project on Lubondo, which is a completely different topic, but an opportunity arose to go and, and look at them. And we continued to do parasite, post-parasite ecology there as well. Um, so. I managed to get in about 20 years research in Africa. And during the time, all of, all of these things became possible because of the support, the enthusiasm that I got from a number of different people. Um, Professor Kawai was the person who introduced me to Japanese primatology, introduced me to my future mentor, my graduate advisor, Professor Hitani. And through him, I went to Mahale and met Mohammedi. And that, that relationship, that in interaction with him and, and um, self-medication blossomed into work with ethnobotany, ethnopharmacology. It, it brought in collaborators from around the world, basically. Um, Phytochemists at, at Kyoto University started doing the first studies of the um, phytochemistry of this bitter tasting plant. We started to look at other plants as well. Um, but just these small little events triggered these larger projects. Um, and, and all it took was, was this, this understanding about the animals and their daily lives becoming the monkey, becoming the, the, the chimpanzee, to, to pick up on things that are unusual from the normal. Um, and of course, some of my best mentors, as, as I'm alluding to, were actually the, 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 the primates themselves that I was looking at. Um, here's just, just four individuals that I, I can fit on this, on this slide, but Glantz 6476, who introduced me to their stone play culture. 
Deco 64 was a very charismatic character. We had long-term records at, at um, Arashiyama since 1954. The genealogy is complete since 1954 and it continues today. So we knew about the history of all of the in individuals in the group. Their, um, where their interactions with, with, with others, big events in their lives, all of these things were recorded by primatologists who worked at the site one after another, and we shared this information. Um, a, a lot of it was also published, so we have these long-term records. And one time, Professor Yutani mentioned in a um, seminar of his, is one of, one of the things that Japanese primatologists do is study the history of groups of primates, because we do long-term field research, we do individual identification, like most primatologists are doing today. Um, but they were really interested in the, the sociological aspects as well. So they had a different perspective. And I was able to appreciate that through my experiences at Arashiyama with all the background that my um, predecessors had, had, had gathered. And just, just the day-to-day -day discussions about what this individual did and that individual, you begin to really appreciate the depth and breadth of their social lives and how that feeds out into everything else that they do. Chao Shiku was actually the first chimpanzee that I met when I arrived in Mohale in 1985, uh, in, in 1987. Um, we dragged ourselves into camp, very, very tired from a, a, about a 15 hour boat ride down Lake Tanganyika. We arrived early in the morning, dehydrated, really, really hungry, and we, we got the camp cooked to boil some rice and we we're just kind of exhausted. I was sprawled out on a bench and Chaoshku walks into camp with her infant Chopin to see who, 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 who the new folks in town were. She had a, she, her home range was close to our camp area. So she came and she, she heard that we, she could hear our activity there. So she came. And so that was the first chimpanzee that I learned about. And the next trip um, in, 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 in 87, now the first trip was 85. And again, in 1987, she showed me um, her secret about bitter pith chewing and Vernonia. So that's how I really got started with animal self-medication from, from her um, examples from her behavior. And it was Wanaguma, one of the oldest chimpanzees in the Mahale M group. She was 50 years old when I was starting the work. She was the mother of the alpha male who had been in the, an alpha male for 13 years. Um, and she had a very special position in the group, unlike other elderly females who didn't have offspring in the group, she kind of kept a, a central position and was always greeted and, and had access to things that some of these other females didn't. But it was while I was following Wanaguma that I came across Chaoshiku when she was sick. So I owe a lot of, of things to her as well um, that, that got me in, in tune with what Chao Shiku was doing. They happened to be at the same place at the same time. Um, and towards the end of my career in Africa, I got a graduate student, a, a student who wanted to, to come into the lab and work with me from Sri Lanka. Um, some of you may know Charmali Nahalage. She came as a master's student and a PhD. She worked with me on stone handling. She did some very excellent captive studies. But early on, when she was still finishing up her master's, we discussed the possibility of her working in Sri Lanka, maybe for her PhD. So that's where I met um, Wolf Didis. We went to visit him and to discuss about some possibilities of things to do in Sri Lanka. Um, I fell in love with the island, a beautiful place. I understand why Wolf has spent so much of his life there. Um, so we began to, um, Charmley and I began to, to, to do field work in, in earnest in 2006. And that opened up a whole, a whole nother world to me, a whole nother group of primates, um, two Langer species and the toke macaque. 
Um, and one of the things that we were interested in doing, because Wolf had, had done these really amazing long-term studies at Potonarua, we wanted to see what was going on in some other sites. So we started traveling all around the island so that I could get an idea of the different habitats, the different types of, of, um, of the environment that these primates are living in. And it's an amazing island. If you ever have an opportunity to go, please, please do. Um, it's just so diverse, so, so many different species, not just primates, but everything is so amazing. And that's, that's what really got me hooked on, on Sri Lanka and, and, and working there. Um, during our surveys, we would take GPS points and we could map out the distribution of where the different species and the subspecies are. That began to, to raise some questions. And we were going at low altitudes and high altitudes. And one of the things that kind of stuck out was that these guys' tails are different lengths and different altitudes. So we, we started collecting photos. Um, and it wasn't until later on that we had developed a method that we could actually um, calculate an, an index of body to tail length. But we were able to do that eventually. And that opened up another area of study. We finally published that in, in 2020. But we looked at the influence of elevation on different morphological characteristics. Tail length was, was one thing that, that stood out very, very nicely, very clearly fitting into Allen's rule, the ecological model of, of how body dimension adapts within a species or a species group to temperature as a way to thermoregulate. We were also collecting samples for DNA work. We were looking at, at, at subspeciation of the toke macaque. Classically, they're, they're divided into three subspecies based on morphology. But from the genetics, we found that there's two different haplogroups, and those three subspecies are intermixed within those two. So that's another piece of the pu puzzle that we're still trying to figure out. But just one of, one of the many different um, topics that, that you can pick in an island like Sri Lanka. So we, we kind of took the uh, opportunity of, of what this habitat had to offer and did what, what we, we could with it. Um, and another thing that we've, we've just written up, it's, it's still in press, but we're also in, interested in, in primate fossils. Are, are, th this, of course, is not very old. It's only about 6,000 years ago. So, of course, it'll be the same species. But we were able to look at, at the, the three subspecies in Potana, which is in the central dry or central intermediate zone of Sri Lanka. It's, it's a drier um, mid-altitude area um, where all three, subs all three primates are found, toke macaque, purple face, langur, and the gray langur. And we were able to, to demonstrate that all three subspecies were there, that they were being hunted and eaten by the people living in this cave in, in Botana. But now we've got samples and access to samples of all the way back, some like 45,000 years ago, some of the oldest human settlements in Southeast, in South, Southeast Asia. So we, we want to look at, at the fossil um, evidence as well to see how far back these three species were on the island. So over this 42 years, this is a very quick, quick introduction to that, that, that body of work that I've been involved in, starting from a, a young boy in Colorado who didn't, hadn't left his state until he was 18 years old. Um, as of this year, I, I've managed to have collaborations and to travel in, in many different places around the world and, and, and work with, with, with people in very diverse topics, um, with diverse disciplines at their um, dispose, disposal to try and look at these basic questions that I've had over the years from different approaches, different angles. And that's been very fruitful have been able to develop a lot of nice friendships and um, a, a lot of interesting science um, along the way. As they say, science is 
percent inspiration as as I was telling you some of the 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 longest studies that I've I've the long term studies that I've been able to to um, pursue have been based on very like one one on one was on a, a fifteen minute episode, and another one was on a two day episode, and others just very brief brief things that caught my attention that that got me in, interested in, and led to different types of studies. Um, but a lot of different things happen. So science is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. There's a lot of work you have to do to, once you get those, those, that inspiration to put it to paper without publications, then no one else knows what you did and the science won't develop. So that led to a lot of, of, of interesting um, collaborations, I, as I mentioned, a lot of work with different people. We've, we've studied 15 different primate species from apes to lemurs um, and other mammals as well, inter, interrelated to some of these topics, especially animal self-medication, and led to work in a lot of different countries. So it's, it's, it's been a long, a long journey but it's been over, it's it's happened like 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 the, the, the snap of a finger. Forty two years is over before you know it. So if you're starting your career, get started now. Keep keep at it. But the harder you work, the more the more you do, the more you'll have to to show for it in the end. Um, and a few things that I've I've learned along the way. I, I've been been trying to think of some different things over the last two weeks or so. Um, have a hobby. Don't don't work always on on your science. Sometimes you, your mind needs a break. Find something that allows you to take your mind off off of your big your big question, your your, your problems when you get stuck. Take a walk, take a hike, read a book. If you have have another hobby. Do that, and 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 those problems will will get solved in your mind. Things will work work out. Collaborate with people you, you get along with. Friends and research can last a lifetime. Um, Vernon Reynolds and, and Wolfgang are, are, are good examples. I've known them for a long, long time, and, and we've um, been involved in, in different projects together. And, and it, it really makes your career, makes your life that much more enjoyable if you, you maintain these long friendships with your colleagues. No species is an island. Your, your species exists where it is because of everything around it, the, the plants and the other animals, and they're interacting with each other. So as Professor Itani always um, urged us to do, to, to learn about the, the local people, what, what they do, how they view nature, what are the plants that they eat, um, what, what animals do they eat, all kinds of questions. So you, you really have to look not just at the species, but at everything that, that whole in environment that it lives in, and it will lead to new questions. It will give you a different um, um, perspective on, on what they're doing and why they're doing it. And again, I can't make, I, I can't say this enough, make the most of unexpected events in your study. The most fruitful projects aren't always the ones that you plan. Things happen and that's when things get interesting. Sometimes they 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 provide a new um, perspective onto something you've been looking at. Sometimes they'll lead you in a whole different direction. But there's always something out there that um, something new to be to be studied. I've I've heard over many many years um, some of some of my senior colleagues would say, "Ah, oh, there's there's nothing left to study about the Japanese macaques. We know everything about chimpanzees." But we don't. They're always doing something new, always teaching us something new about themselves. So keep your eyes open for those those curious things that that happen once once in a while. And it's always it's always interesting to to to, to develop new skills for yourself, whether it's it's new statistics or 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 some analytical tool, or even just another perspective. When I started out. I was interested in, in mate choice, social learning, and then um, animal self-medication. But in the end, they're all interconnected. And to understand even those interconnections, I needed to interact with other people who had other experiences. 
um, mathematicians, chemists, things like that. So really, you know, open your mind, open your heart. There's, there's a lot out there to, to, to study. And passion and perseverance, both of those will get you through the hard times. Not, not every, everything will go your way along the time of your career. After I got my PhD, it took me 10 years to get a job. I was from postdoc to postdoc. Sometimes I was just, just getting by um, correcting manuscripts, but I was always in the field. I was always collecting data. I was always able to write. Um, I always had a desk at the university that I could, could work from. And the, the rest of the things will, will work themselves out. But patience, passion, and perseverance. And uh, most important, be a monkey. Always be curious about things around you. And this is one that I, I, I like to, to, to teach, to, to tell the high school students that I, I lecture to every year in, in a, a Japanese science program called Super Science High School. I'll, I'll talk to high school students um, in, in a local high school. I've been doing that for about 17 years now. And Especially at that age, you, you, you're, you're, you're trying to, you're, you're, you're finding yourself out what you, what you want to do. But even as, as a graduate student, you may not still quite know what you want to do. But one way to get, to, to move ahead is to have a dream, make a goal, go after that goal. And when that's completed, make the next one. Just have big dreams so that you can grow into them. 